Okay, good morning to everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us to this webinar about cryptos. Okay, first of all, I want to thank you all and thank our premium members uh, from the Swiss Chamber of Commerce and our allies, the European Chambers and the Swiss Chambers of Latin America for supporting us um, throughout all our activities. And thank you to our financial committee leader, Christian Monch. Uh, he is a Swiss Venezuelan lawyer specialized in private banking in Switzerland. And he has a um, crypto finance expert diploma issued in Switzerland. And he has more than 20 years working in private banking and other financial services. And he is the director of the Venezuelan Swiss Chamber of Commerce and Industry and a founding member and director of the Swiss Panamanian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, today, we want to welcome uh, 21 Shares, uh, a company that believes in making crypto more accessible to a wider audience uh, in a safe and professional and regulated way for private and in institutional investors. 21 Shares is registered in Zug, Switzerland, and was established in July 2018 from the co-founders Hani Rashwan and Ophelia Schneider to satisfy their personal need to invest in cryptos and touched a few months ago by 2 billion OUMs. Since their first ETP launch, the product suite has, been, has grown to 15 products in four currencies. Uh, our special guest is Hani Rashwan, co-founder and CEO of Amun and 21 Shares. Hani is the co-founder and CEO of 21 Shares which seeks to create an easy, secure, and regulated way to access to crypto assets class. And 21 Shares is listed the world's first crypto index ETP on six Swiss exchange at the end of 2018 and has the world largest product suit or physically backed crypto ETPs. Prior to what 21 Shares, Hany built Payout, an API for disbursements that was used by online lenders and was acquired in 2017. The initial company he started, Ribbon, was the first to put social commerce buy buttons inside Facebook and Twitter. He's Forbes 30 under 30 award recipient and graduated from Columbia University Magna Cum Laude. We also have Sina Meyer, Managing Director and Head of Switzerland of 21 Shares. Sina joined 21 Shares in January 2020 from her previous role at Credit Agricole, Credit Agricole Suisse, uh, where she was heading uh, the business development for Swiss German and French speaking part of Switzerland. Over 25 years in finance, she holds a diploma as certified international wealth manager, manager and has held various positions within major financial institutions like Credit Agricole, Claridelle and UBS. Then we have our um, financial analyst and uh, Swiss Chamber of Commerce founding member, Juan Ernesto Arteaga, who will be the moderator of this event. Uh, Juan is graduated with an MBA from Stern Business School in New York University, and he's a partner in a company called A2. And with this, I would like to give the floor to 21 shares. I will share now the presentation. And let's see. can you guys see? Perfect. Thank okay. you so much, Elena, for your introduction. Okay. Thank you, Sina. And for everyone who wants to place uh, any questions, please write on the chat and I will pass to the moderators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, for your kind introduction and welcome, Hanny. Can you hear us? Are you with us? I'm here. Hello. Super great. The, the timing will be like that, guys. Um, we prepared for you about 15, 20 minutes of uh, intro section, a little bit what we do, who we are, and then uh, a short um, introduction about um, crypto assets. And then it will get like extremely, extremely interactive because Hanny will answer to the questions from the from you from you everybody when you can send the, your questions to elena and this will be in the after about i would say like 15 20 minutes so henny are you ready for the questions after 
Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Let's start it then, Elena. So that's us, not very exciting. Let's go to the next slide then, please. Super, thank you so much. So Elena will be our slide master. Just that you know, it will not be myself. So I will always tell you, Elena, which slide we are going. First, hello, yes, my name is Sina. I'm from Switzerland. And um, Elena introduced us already really well. Um, I've been in the financial industry for quite a while and I'm responsible for the Swiss market at 21 shares since January last year. We can go um, to the slide number three. So you surely want to know who we are and what we do, even though Elena said already quite a lot about us. So in a nutshell, 21 shares is a Swiss product issuer who touched exactly like she said already this year, the 2 billion asset on the management. We make investing in crypto's assets as easy as buying a stock. And you can use actually only your already existing um, bank or broker. The company was founded in 2018 by Hany, of course, who is our boss today, and also with um, his co-founder, uh, Ophelia. And um, they have launched several world first, um, um, which is really exciting. One of these is, for example, the, the HODL, the top five uh, crypto baskets, which we're having. We're coming later a little to that. And all our products are uh, physically backed 100%, segregated and are allowed to retail and institutional investors. So like everybody can be part of the best performing asset class of the last decade. So we really believe in this and we will continue to issue more um, digital asset products in the coming months. So I would advise you stay tuned because a lot of cool stuff is coming out. And uh, what will be interesting for you to know is that we also create tailor-made white labeling um, for crypto ETPs with institutional partners. So in case someone is interested in, you, if, um, in the crowd of you, please let us now know and reach out to us. Then we can go to slide number four, please. So we've currently 15 different solutions. We have the largest product suite worldwide. We said this already before. We had single trackers, baskets, and the first Bitcoin short product where you can hedge your position if you want, where you cannot find anywhere else. This is really specific. The reason why we can offer all these regulated solutions is because we have we're based in Switzerland. And we have an excellent relationship in the community and with the regulators here. We go to slide number five. This is just to show you um, a, a wide range of solutions. Our typically investors are private bankers, banks, indi um, independent asset managers, hedge fund managers, um, family offices, but of course also private um, investors like everybody or like the high net worth individuals. I would say like 75% of our product is maybe bought by institutionals and the 25% by retail investors. But we got for, um, before we go further, I wanted to tell you that this short webinar can't go into all the details about um, um, crypto assets. Um, if you're if you're interested, um, we, we show you after how you can subscribe to our, our newsletter because we have a super great free newsletter where you can actually follow what's going on in the crypto market, educational side, but also product side, whatever for everybody will be something on these newsletters. So it could be extremely a, a, a value for you, for, for everybody who's listening today. So, so let's start now this so, short session, right? And we go to slide number six, please. This is important, the slide number six, because I give you some facts and figures. As most of our brains, by the way, are not designed to read and to listen at the same time, I will go through number six to the slide with us together, okay? So 2.1 trillion total market value, all the crypto, then 42% uh, Bitcoin's market shares of the crypto markets alone valued at 920 billion. There are about 400 trading venues such as crypto exchanges, derivative exchanges, decentralized exchanges, and OTC desk, and of course also products like ours. There are about 140 billion in trading volume. It's not a, it's not a very small number, guys, right? 100 million crypto users 
in less than um, two, it is less about of 2.5% of the internet population. And I show you why I, I, we compare this to the internet population, because there is, of course, a link. Then the Q2 market activity snapshot, there's about 1.5 trillion monthly Bitcoin fut uh, futures volume, about 900 billion of monthly spot volume, and about 11 billion monthly Bitcoin options volume. This is to show you how big this market is at the moment, because most of the people really think that it's much less than that. And there is, there is a lot of huge potential to go even further and for all, for, for, for all our, for our um, economy. So now we stay a little bit on the slide number six and we, I will tell you, so what are crypto assets? We don't show you any slides for this. Um, so your eyes can relax and you can just listen to my very nice uh, Swiss German accent for a while. A crypto asset is a financial um, asset based on the internet, which uses cryptography to secure its financial transactions, control creation and um, additional units, and verify the transfer of assets. Typically, crypto assets use some um, form of decentralized control. This is important, as opposite of the other assets, such like currencies like US dollars and uh, other fiat currencies like uh, US dollars, etc., which we lay, of course, on centralized uh, parties like central banks, etc. The first crypto asset is uh, Bitcoin and was released as open source software in 2009. And since then, a wide range of crypto assets have been released, often borrowing from the technology of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was created by a pseudonymous developer called Satoshi Nakamoto, sounds very Asian. We don't know if this is a man, if it is a woman, if it's a group of people who build on research done on internet-based money dating back from 1983. Today's Bitcoin client code runs uh, on computers all over the world, which all play their part in helping validate transactions and maintain Bitcoin economic security. Bitcoin's founder uh, disappeared, by the way, in, in uh, year 2010. The key innovation of Bitcoin and other crypto assets can be understood as follows. Crypto assets made possible decentralized uh, financial value transfer on the internet. Before Bitcoin, most financial value transfer which occurred off the internet and all financial value on the internet required a third party to validate transaction and maintain the given financial system. We know, of course, this system really well. Decentralization can be defined as the process where power and control is dispersed away from a central authority. In a Bitcoin's case, the network operates on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, so from one to the other one. Decentralization is, most because, is, is important because it ensures that non-third party can theoretically pretend a financial transaction from occurring on a crypto asset like Bitcoin. The key innovation on crypto asset is that they allow for decentralized value transfer on the internet. It is done through two innovations. One, the blockchain data structure, of course, and the second one, a proof of work mining. Let's speak about this like the little steps and then after I will stop and go back to the slide, I promise. The history of transactions for a crypto asset are stored in a data structure called a blockchain. A blockchain is a continuously growing list of records called blocks, which are connected to each other through a use of cryptography. Blocks are designed in such a way to be resistant to the modification of the data start on the block. All allowance for each block to be independently verified by nodes in the network. And I guess Henny will speak about this a little bit more in details later, because there might be some questions about this validation and for the nodes, the network. 
once a block has been validated, it's impossible to undo because you need to have the okay or from the most of the, uh, of the network from the maturity. Otherwise, you cannot make it back. I could continue here with some theory, but let's go back to the slides because we want to have also after the Q&A questions. So let's go to slide number seven, please. Crypto adoption. We show you here a comparison uh, in time with internet to show you there are still very, that we are still in very, very early stage. And uh, now I would have to say like, no, it's not too late. Even our networks ask us all the time, aren't it too late? Or is it too late now to invest? It's definitely not too late, especially, especially not now. So if you compare here, we, I spoke about this in 1997, there were 10 million internet users. And you know that I told you before, for, for using um, crypto assets or Bitcoins even, you need to have an internet connection, right? So now we're in 2021 and there are about 10 million crypto users. So more or less the same like in 1997, the people using internet, you get the connection internet and digital assets. And to show you this one, going back to the right-hand side, where you can see the internet today with 4.6 billion internet users. And today, like I just mentioned, there are 10 um, million crypto asset users. So if, if you can see the upside, the huge upside potential from the crypto assets compared to the internet, because we are very, very early stage here. Henny, if you want to jump in at any time, please let me know. Huh? If we go to next slide, please, to slide number eight. So this is definitely something um, which is, uh, I want to show you, which is important that you get this overview. And I was speaking during my lunchtime with a client about this because it gets really confusing. And I wanted to make you that you really get it visually, what's the difference? If we look at the left-hand side, you can see Bitcoin. Bitcoin, by the way, for us, it's not the currency, it's much more. For us, it's the digital gold and, of course, also the largest crypto asset. Then we have Ethereum, the second largest crypto asset. Ethereum is not a currency. Ethereum is kind of a platform for decentralized um, applications called DApps for short. And they're not comparable like this because they're completely two different crypto assets. And then we have also, and you heard this pro uh, probably a lot from your network, we have also Ether. Ether is the currency which you use on the Ethereum platform. So it's very important that you see these kind of three different things. Bitcoin, the digital gold, at Ethereum, which is um, the, and the platform the decentral for decentralized applications, and Ether, which is um, the currency for at Ethereum. And which is also important maybe for you, which kind of could help you. We just, um, our research team said for months and months, that at Ethereum is undervalued. We saw this in the chart, that at Ethereum is undervalued. And we issue, I think it's next week, if I'm not mistaken, a brand new magazine where we show the, the investors or all the network, not only investors, what it is about at Ethereum. Because at Ethereum, it's something in your ears which you should really keep and say like oh, to, to follow because it could so many things are built on at Ethereum. But I don't want to go more in details right now than that. Then if we go to slide number nine, please. So you might have heard or read all kinds of measurements how to value Bitcoin, right? The, the valuation methods um, of Bitcoin and also other cryptocurrency or crypto assets is not the same metrics than traditional uh, measures like Elion waves, Fibonacci level, and everything what you can hear from finance, right? From time to time, it might help, yes, for the charts, but in general, it's completely different measures. Um, our research team issued a special research magazine about this topic, by the way. All this information is on our internet page, um, 21shares.com. You can also check it and then download it. And um, as we uh, are at 21 said, look like Bitcoin as the digital gold, we compare here Bitcoin price with gold. So you see, if Bitcoin reaches the market value of gold, 
the price for Bitcoin will go to 535,000. And we have this also at the right hand side, a comparison where you see the gold of a total of uh, 10 trillion and Bitcoin for 830 billion. So divided that, it, go, it goes to 535,000 per Bitcoin. This is just to give a comparison if you compare it really to the gold. And if we go one slide to slide number 10, please. Um, this is one slide actually Hanny loves a lot, I know that. Because if we compare Bitcoin with gold, and you will see that Bitcoin has many more positive features than gold. Um, in every feature like um, scarcity, uh, transferability, and um, storability, diversifiability, and um, Bitcoin wins. Because if we see, for example, just to give you um, as a scarce gold, we know is limited, but Bitcoin is really only programmed for 20 uh, 21 million Bitcoin. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. It's already in the program. You can see this in, in the, if you want to go to the, to, the, to the white paper, we call it, where the code is on it, you can see it's only programmed 21 uh, million of Bitcoin. Also, gold is difficult to, to transfer. It's heavy and it's not really, really useful. Bitcoin is super easy to transfer. One click, as if maybe some of you have already done it, it's one click in a couple of seconds. It's at the other side. Also, um, it's an open source and temper resistant Bitcoin. And also, how do you divide actually gold? It's not really easy dividable. But if you go to, to Bitcoin, this is, it's really easy to divide. Even you can have kind of eight different um, zeros after, after the, the, the comma. You can really divide, divide Bitcoin in very, very small um, very, very small measurements. They're not called Bitcoin ones after, it's called Satoshis. They're very, um, they're, they're after the, 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 how you say that, after the comma. Just to show you that Bitcoin is much, for many things, so much better than gold, even if we compare it to gold. That's why we think it's the digital future gold. Well, if we go to slide number 11, and I love this chart. It was created by our research team, actually. If you look at the chart, I want to show you the following. Bitcoin goes through cycles, sometimes speculative, so too high, and then it falls for a while, right? Every time Bitcoin reaches a new all-time high, we go in a kind of bull phase for almost one year. In 2013, if you look at, this, uh, at the picture, Bitcoin exceeds 80, we love that now, 80 US dollars for the first time. I hope some of you were already inside. Then the price went up 38 times over 10, uh, over 1,000 within a year, and then down for a while. And in 2017, it went up to about, from about 1,100, 1,200, then 17 times up to 20,000. Here, I think some of the people were of us were already inside, right? Me not, but uh, I was, uh, some of them, you were probably lucky. Today, we are around, I think I, mean, I checked before the webinar, we were about 47,000, something like that. And after some corrections in the last weeks or even months, and we think it will be even more extreme this time. Because since Corona is not a retail, um, it's not really a, a negative thing. We saw that not only retailers going, but also institutionals now are looking around for alternatives. The first ones have already arrived, and maybe Henny will speak about this a little bit later. And more will come and invest as well. So we intensify and have a very very strong impact on the Bitcoin price. Of course, I don't have a crystal ball, I tell you right away, but this is what we can read from the chart to this one. So Corona is not having a negative impact on Bitcoin, quite the opposite. Then we go to almost the last slide, slide number 12. This chart shows your comparison of Bitcoin with Ethereum, and I showed you before the differences, just roughly. The current, um, the, the, the Ethereum is the, the, the second biggest one, crypto assets. I think there's, I don't have to say much about it, right? Since January um, 2021, Bitcoin is up about 
and Ethereum is up 321%. And to compare with S&P 500 index, which is up about uh, 21%, I think, since the beginning of the year. Just to show you the relations between Bitcoin and Ethereum and also the S&P 500 index, just to compare with that. And the last slide before I hand over is slide number 13. A little more, bit, bit, bit more again into finance. With this illustration, I wanted to show you how an asset allocation of a portfolio could look like. In general, we say always that 21 shares, um, we don't say like only cryptos, of course. We say something healthy would be up on the risk appetite for someone between 0.5% and maybe 5%. But let's say we take 1%, which is completely something which is okay for a portfolio. So 1% of a portfolio of 30 million wealth would make then about 300,000 crypto in, in crypto assets, right? So the fact is there would not even be enough Bitcoin um, of one Bitcoin for every billionaire on this world, right? This proves again that the upside potential is really huge and uh, we are only in the beginning of this whole crypto adaption. And I hope this was interesting for you to give you a very, very short snapshot about it. Now I hand over to our moderator and I'm very pleased, Henny, please you guys go ahead. Thank you much for your attention. One has to de- we have technical issues. Henny and Juan, can you? Give me a second. I'm going to. We are right back. It's the warm up for your voice, then, Henny and uh, Juan. I'm gonna... Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, 21 Shares, for being here, Hani and Sina. And of course, uh, thanks to all the audience. Uh, this is a great opportunity to learn more about cryptocurrencies. And Hani, I'm going to start with, with the basics in terms of the coverage and what we see generally, or the general people and investors see about the cryptocurrencies, which is the this store value or way of investing and sometimes speculate. People are intrigued and wants to know uh, how they can make money with it. That's, that, that's the reality. Uh, so it would be interesting for you to tell us a bit about a, what should be the approach for an investor to really make a smart decision regarding his portfolio since uh, it's, it's still a risky asset. And then we can concentrate more in all these applications uh, and, and, and that we can have with the cryptocurrency and the fundamentals that is driving them, such as the gold comparison or the uh, capacities and, and application of Ethereum. Absolutely. So um, I think the, the first thing is I would want to bucket and categorize crypto assets a bit differently before we can talk about how to value each one of them. Um, I think that there is a fundamental difference between, um, if you talk about crypto assets, there's a fundamental difference between crypto commodities like Bitcoin um, that exist as currently emerging stores of value that could rival gold one day. Uh, we have to differentiate that from blockchain and, and smart contract platforms where, like Ethereum which exist to allow applications and developers to build on top of their infrastructure. Um, and then the last bucket would be more uh, payment kind of uh, uh, coins, whether that be a stable coin that might be tied on a one-to-one -one basis with a US dollar or a Euro, um, or um, things that can ease, more easily facilitate wires or things like that. Uh, that are designed for back and forth methods of, of payments, methods of transactions. Um, if we talk about the first example with, with Bitcoin, uh, the valuation comparison between Bitcoin and gold is, is, is pretty easy. Um, I think someone said this already in, in some of the comments on the video, but 
uh, we can take the, uh, a look at the current market cap of gold. We can take a look at the current market cap of Bitcoin. Uh, assume that the current market cap of gold is the total market for using something like gold to hedge um, or to have a non-sovereign store of value. And then we can understand the opportunity that exists for, for Bitcoin. Um, and that is where you get some of the estimates of the Bitcoin price uh, potentially going up to 400,000, 500,000 US dollars per Bitcoin. Um, the arguments that we, that we make, the arguments that we see and believe in is that we are moving from um, what is an antiquated analog technology that is gold into something that is built for the digital age, that is Bitcoin. Uh, there was a slide that Sina went through um, that basically looks at all the features between um, and, and features differences between gold and Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is better than gold on every feature, except for shininess. Uh, gold is admittedly more shiny. Uh, Bitcoin is more easily um, limited. Uh, it is fixed. Gold is rare, which means there's not that much of it. Whereas with Bitcoin, we have a, a specific numerical fixed supply that it cannot exceed. Uh, Bitcoin is much more easily uh, transferable. Um, Bitcoin is much more easily storable. It's less hard to fake uh, than gold, and it's infinitely more divisible, which helps with the transferability. It helps with the uh, verifiability and, and other features. And so from a feature perspective, Bitcoin beats gold on a number of different aspects. Um, and we feel very good about that in the medium and the long term. Um, there are additional implications that could come from that. Bitcoin. Uh, may uh, not just replace gold, which we strongly believe in, but also could serve in a mix of reserve currencies. Um, I think we are all seeing or have seen, are seeing, or will soon see uh, the end of the American century in one way or another. I think the consensus has, has, has been out on this for, for a while. And with that, one has to think about, well, what is the new reserve currency? Reserve currencies are not holy. We used to have um, the Spanish currency as the reserve currency. We used to have the British pound as the reserve currency and obviously no longer is the case. Um, and the question of what could come after the dollar, um, it is potentially very interesting to put Bitcoin in as part of the mix of that. And if that happens, then clearly Bitcoin's value would exceed the 400 or 500,000 USD per coin estimate that we think will happen once Bitcoin eclipses gold. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that um, the US dollar supremacy is, is not um, absolute and, and um, without question. Um, and there's a lot of evidence as well that gold as an investment um, is becoming um, a lot less attractive. Um, gold purchases in typically very gold hungry markets like India and China um, are at lows. In China, among specific demographics, they're at an all decade low. Um, and if you take a look at the intergenerational shift uh, between uh, um, young people, millennials uh, that are up and coming and will soon have enhanced economic power, they're overwhelmingly purchasing Bitcoin uh, rather than gold. Um, and so that is the price um, discussion and how we think about it with respect to Bitcoin. We have some research on our website on Bitcoin valuation methodologies. Uh, a lot of it mimics gold valuation methodologies. We can look at things like uh, mining difficulties, et cetera. One would argue that since it's a little bit more digital as a technology, it's actually easier to value. Um, and I would invite anyone to go to 21shares.com slash research and download our Bitcoin valuation methodology. And, and there's a lot of um, helpful information there. Um, the second thing that I can talk about is Ethereum and all the smart contract platforms. For that one, it's actually pretty easy. Um, Ethereum is a blockchain that allows you to build on top of it, to build blockchain enabled applications, whether that is um, a game in the Philippines or a title property register um, verifier in, in, uh, in Greece or um, a stable coin uh, somewhere in New York City. Um, 
without needing to build your own blockchain and setting it up. You can just use um, uh, or rent rather Ethereum's infrastructure. And it's, it's booming, it's very popular. Um, one very easy way of looking at how potentially to value Ethereum um, is by looking at the fees that are collected by the network. And so the native currency of, of Ether, ETH, uh, is what is used to pay um, uh, for blockchain access on the Ethereum blockchain. So in, if you want to have an application where, for example, maybe you're playing a game, in order to do a single action in the game or to purchase a membership in the game, you're actually buying it with Ethereum. Um, you're paying for Ethereum in order for the transaction to happen. Um, and we can take a look at the um, average daily uh, fees that are collected by the Ethereum network. Um, last time I looked at it was a couple days ago um, and Ethereum had collected $34 million that day in fees. That annualizes um, to, I think, over $12 billion. Um, you can assign a tech multiple on it. You can look at the growth. You can look at things like that and have a pretty good gauge of where Ethereum uh, should be valued. And that's similar for all of Ethereum's competitors as well. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, Annie, is a very good introduction. Thank you. Um, so basically, we, we can think about the cryptocurrencies right now as a generation shift, a, a, a value comparison with the gold as fundamentals to invest, and also the applications, the technology application. That's what I understand. Now, there is a very important issue uh, around us about the cryptocurrency, and is the issue of trust. Many people, uh, important people uh, talk about the uh, cryptocurrency as a fraud or as a Ponzi scheme. Uh, how can an investor handle and in, in what are the key components to, for them to, to change their mind or understand that this is not this type uh, of, of issue are, are a problem, but um, uh, this is the future of, of technology and the way people transact. I think we have to just be very honest and fair uh, with what we compare it against. Um, if we're comparing it with, with fiat money, with cash, um, I'm American. Um, every $100 bill has some cocaine residue on it because that's how much that's used in, in the illicit drug trade. Every single $100 bill out there has some cocaine residue on it. Um, and so it remains to date the easiest and most popular way of doing fraudulent and criminal transactions is simple cash. Um, nothing has changed on that. Um, from a security perspective, Bitcoin tends to be actually a very bad um, technology for criminals to use. And that's because there's a record of it uh, at all times. We've seen this consistently, by the way. Um, there are a number of times where a hack happens, someone hacks it, and then a day or two later, we discover who it is because it's very easy to look at the blockchain where every transaction that has ever happened or ever will happen will be shared publicly for all to see and figure out who is it that is behind this. We leave trails, we leave signs, et cetera. So it's not really anonymous, it's uh, pseudonymous. But the authorities, the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, um, MI6, Mossad, whatever, have been able to use the blockchain to track down criminal activities in a far superior way than they have been able to do before in the past with, uh, with cash. And so I would actually just looking at the evidence, looking at the feature set, reject that question completely. Um, please, if there, is, if there are any criminals out there, please use Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, because we will be able to find you much faster and much easier. Um, and so for, you know, um, any dumb criminals out there, please use crypto uh, because that is the easiest way to get caught. Um, that is how we think about it from a feature perspective. Now, if you think about it from an investor perspective, certainly um, there are companies like ours that uh, guarantee um, that all the assets that you're investing in have never been involved in a hack, are clean, uh, we have the ability to verify that the Bitcoins that are in our uh, funds and in our ETPs have never 
uh, been involved in a um, in a public theft or a public hack. Uh, we know which coins have been involved. We know we, we flag them on the blockchain and we don't interact with them. They don't have the ability of entering within our uh, ecosystem. And by the way, um, this is across the industry. Uh, reputable crypto exchanges do the same thing. And so if you're interacting with crypto in a regulated fashion, um, uh, the chances are that institution has had to do a number of things to guarantee um, the safety of, um, of the assets that are, that are held. Um, and then the last thing is, um, I think you have to ask, well, who am I investing with? Um, you're investing in an asset class that also has the Harvard and Yale endowment, uh, some of the top hedge funds in the world, some of the top funds in the world. Some companies, central banks have um, held, or uh, at some points we've known this because they've sold some, uh, Bitcoins on their balance sheets. Um, numerous government agencies, numerous people in the financial industries, numerous endowment funds. Um, and so it's uh, the company that, that you keep and the company that is investing alongside you in the asset class uh, is pretty good as well. And, and so I think those are some of the ways that um, you can both become more comfortable and realize this isn't nearly as big an issue as sometimes the press makes it seem. So uh, basically, uh, based in your statement, we can conclude that the, it's a myth, the, the criminal and and money, money, not money laundering, but perhaps there is some as everything, but, but there is no a big issue about the, the criminality or the possibles of, of commit more crimes with cryptocurrencies None uh, of versus the, the fiat yeah, money. Exactly. It's, it's pretty difficult to use crypto for criminal activities and get away with it because everything is tracked. So imagine if every single payment that a criminal makes, there's a record of it. When did they make it? How much was it? Who did they send it to? Um, and we can very easily track some of that stuff. Okay. Um, there, and by the way, is, criminal activities okay. also in, involves things like tax evasion, right? So it's not just drug money, but even people that are trying to evade taxes using crypto are getting caught uh, pretty easily as well. Okay. Um, there is, I, looking at the questions from the audience and everything, uh, there is, uh, some topics that repeat itself a lot. One, uh, some people are more interested in the technology and, and what, how the governments and, and countries can benefit from, from this new technology. Yeah. Um, what, what, what will be your, your opinion and, and the ways that, that, that a country, and we have the example of Salvador right now with some, some initiative in that area. Uh, yeah. How, how will be the benefits in that area for everyone? Um, I think in a very similar way to what we've seen sometimes in Africa with leapfrogging technologies where broadband wasn't as popular, but mobile phones were, um, and the ability to just jump very quickly. We've seen it in India. We've seen it in various parts of Africa. Um, there, there can be a tremendous amount of economic benefits from sort of skipping to the front of the line. Um, crypto is a very digital technology. It's not analog. Um, when you realize the capabilities of crypto, you also realize the limitations of our current financial system. Um, the stock exchange is closed more hours of the week than it is open. This is a fact that none of us really think too much about or, or analyze. Um, the stock exchange in some parts of the world, I'm Egyptian, um, our stock exchanges are, are open uh, Sunday to Thursday because our work weeks are different. Uh, the stock exchange in China might be 12 hours uh, ahead of you, and it might involve incredibly um, illiquid or difficult trading dynamics associated with that. It doesn't make sense to have anything like that when I can send you a WhatsApp text any, any minute of the day. Uh, you can send me an email. The internet works any, any hour of the day. Um, the internet does not care if it's Christmas. Uh, the internet does not care if it's Gregorian Western Christmas or Orthodox Christmas. It just works. Um, and so should our payment systems. The fact that we closed down um, after 4.30 p.m. does not make much sense uh, from a pure technological perspective. Of course, people want to transact with each other after 4.30 uh, and before 9.30 a.m. Um, and so I think from, from a pure um, technological feature set, 
uh, there's a tremendous amount of liquidity benefits, efficient markets, et cetera, that one can have um, when they enter the crypto world, including sovereign nations. Um, there's a lot of geopolitical things as well. Um, I think we are all uh, watching with horror and worry. Uh, I think someone mentioned this in the comments by what's going on in Afghanistan right now, what this means vis-a-vis -vis, um, Russia, China, America, the world. Uh, most of us come from countries that are not America, Russia, and China. And so we're sort of caught in the middle and trying to figure out what, what, is, what is going to happen, what the new dynamics will be. Um, and on that front, Bitcoin offers a neutral third option. It's an insurance policy. Um, it's a hedge. Uh, it's a non-sovereign uh, potential uh, hedge. And, and that can be very, very attractive for a number of countries. Um, and so I think that's how I would characterize it on the, on the Bitcoin front. And then on the technological front, clearly every stock bond uh, commodity, every currency uh, can and will be tokenized at some point so that it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and generally speaking, I think we'll start seeing a lot of countries move a lot of their systems from their currencies to their equities, to their um, other securities uh, on tokenized versions so that they can run on this more efficient system. Hey. In the line of, uh, in the same line of trust and reliability, uh, about the custody of the cryptocurrencies, uh, we have heard uh, in, in the, all those years some big problems of, of of crypto coins disappearing from custodians or wallets. Uh, how that will be fixed? Because we we don't see that now in banks. I mean, we, we can see other stories in, in banks and. Uh, but, uh, but not, not uh, the disappearance of the asset of the clients. Um, what, what are your comments in that area? We only work with um, regulated, qualified third-party custodians um, that custody things in cold storage, meaning that the coins are largely stored in, um, on, on computers that have never been connected to the internet and, and do not have the ability to be connected to the internet, meaning that you, you cannot actually... Um, ever take those coins off of that computer. Um, and the custodians we work with are regulated by the SEC, the FCA, the AFM, et cetera. Um, and oftentimes are also insured such as by Lloyd's of London. Uh, and so we, we only work with these heavily regulated um, qualified custodians that also happen to have uh, pretty rich insurance policies. Um, and when people sometimes ask us about the price, that's part of that's baked into the price, which is why we're a little bit more expensive than say an S&P 500 ETF. Um, it's that this comes with custody taken care of, this comes with insured and regulated custody taken care of so that the, the problems and issues you pose, which are real issues, um, are actually not a concern whatsoever with our product. Would, would you think that this, uh, well, bef before that, I'm going to go later about the, the, the application in countries with, with more trouble with the local currency. But first, uh, as every uh, new technology, there, there is a lot of hype and sometimes many choices. Now, we, we started with Bitcoin and Ethereum right now and are the most important. However, there is many, but really many, many cryptocurrencies with different applications, such as video games and and, and others. Uh, so how do you differentiate and, be, and, and try to mitigate those ones that probably will end up being a, a real fraud or a Ponzi? So I will say this, um, there is a lot of technology, um, but if you look at history on a protocol level, um, the first protocol that reaches mass scale wins, whether or not it's the best protocol. Uh, the examples of this uh, include SMS, which we use on our phone, not the best way of transmitting messages from a technical perspective. We have better technology, but SMS is the first thing that gained widespread adoption. MMS, uh, whenever you're texting uh, photos um, or media. Uh, HTTP, which is what runs our websites. Um, SSL uh, uh, on a number of encryption levels. A lot of these... Uh, protocols are um, not the best technology, but rather the first 
good technology that reached massive scale. Uh, and so from that front, I don't think Bitcoin is going anywhere. Um, Bitcoin as a store of value is, is here to stay. Um, it's going to be very difficult to remove Bitcoin. I am, Bitcoin fundamentally is, is a solution to a longstanding computer science problem. Um, and once they have solved it and put a money angle on top of it, it has now become a verb, a noun, an adjective. Um, it is synonymous with the entire crypto asset class itself. You talk about Bitcoin like you talk about crypto. Um, and we go back and forth without meaning to. So I, I think that Bitcoin has more than proved its, its staying power. On Ethereum and the others, I agree with you. I think that um, Ethereum is very much in the lead. Um, but as someone already said in the comments, the fees on Ethereum are pretty high. Now, they've, they are so far in the lead. It is un, it, it, I, I think that if they were doing 34 million in, in transaction fees, the closest other network was doing a million. Um, the, the gulf between Ethereum and all of the competitors is, is crazy wild. Um, and so it is, uh, in other words, I think it's Ethereum's race to lose and they're in the lead. Um, but they could. And I think you have to think about, uh, well, what, what could possibly happen with that? Um, we are quite bullish on Ethereum. We think that there is a number of other technologies that can come up that could help with Ethereum's scalability. Um, we don't think of um, products like Solana, which we, we have an ETP for, or Polygon, which at some point soon we will have an ETP for, uh, are Ethereum competitors as much as Ethereum uh, complements. They will make Ethereum better, and there is a place for both of them. Um, this is a massive world. If you think about the amount of assets that crypto can touch, the amount of assets that can be tokenized, uh, they're on the order of hundreds of trillions of US dollars. Uh, and so it's not, it's not inconceivable for there to be multiple app stores. After all, we, both the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store are fundamentally uh, great businesses. And if you go one layer deeper on the application layer, where actually we get a lot uh, of, of these new tokens, um, it makes sense that there are uh, hundreds of winners, maybe not tens of thousands. Um, but even if we take a look at technology companies, even if we take a look at application developers on iPhone and, and, and Android, clearly there are many, many, many winners. There are hundreds of unicorns. There are thousands of successful companies and applications. And I would expect to see the same thing. I think there's going to be a world where hundreds of tokens, sometimes you can have a token that just represents one single game. Um, hundreds of tokens will be valuable. Um, and the big ones will still remain the bigger platforms like Bitcoin and Ethereum. But it is, it is our view that this is not a winner take all market. Um, this is going to have a number of different um, uh, winners. What, what what would be your main uh, or, or your, the way of identifying those winners uh, uh, besides Ethereum and Bitcoin, which they are definitely the, the most important right now? Is there any way to, for, for a you can absolutely, investor? Or you can see that the, the activities that are happening on the network, the transaction fees collected by the network, the number of applications on the network, the number of developers using the network, there's a lot of uh, ability to see, well, what is, what is happening here? Is it a ghost town um, or is there some activity? And on those kinds of things, we start to see um, networks like Polkadot, Solana, Polygon really, really shine, uh, where we see fundamentally great technological breakthroughs. They've done something super interesting. Um, and then in addition to that, we also um, can see that, that it is working, that there is some growth uh, that people are using these networks to do various things. About those tokens that are paying interest, uh, is that good? Uh, how does it work? Uh, there have been some, so there are some issues about it with Binance, yeah. I believe. Or... Uh, so, sorry, what do you mean? No, I, about the interest. I mean, there is tokens that are paying interest and there have been very, many issues and, and discussion about it. Is that right? Is 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 Viable. Yeah. I mean, so not how all, does it work? Not all tokens um, pay a yield. Um, it's not interest because 
sometimes it's interest because they're being lent, but sometimes they're staked, which is which is slightly different. But I think the simple way of thinking about this is there are some tokens that can generate yield. Um, some of those we're able to uh, generate the yield on behalf of the user and then return to them that as a dividend in kind on a daily basis. Um, we actually launched the first income generating crypto product in the world, uh, which is our Tezos ETP. Um, and we are soon adding um, staking to a number of our other products, uh, which include Polkadot, um, which I think we've already done. Uh, Solana should come up next. And we will generally speaking, add yield to our products because we think that um, there's additional, obviously, uh, profits to be made uh, by the investors and we seek to help them make those profits and distribute them uh, to them. And so it's pretty difficult setting up the infrastructure to generate this yield, which is why we, um, with billions of dollars under management, have the ability to do it at scale um, and then just giving the rewards back to uh, the end investors. Um, there is, is here a very interesting question um, about the miners. Um, the, the question is about the, the, the complex math problem that the miners, uh, are, are Bitcoin is supposed to be able to, the miners or, or Bitcoins, actually I don't understand very well uh, the technology behind this question, uh, are able to, to solve very complex math problems. Uh, and, and, and the person asks uh, if that's the case, if it's possible, what, what examples can we find in, 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 in this, uh, what problems they can solve that are very, very useful to, to technology or, or, the, or so future technology? It's actually not an interesting problem that they solve at all. It's just a very, um, it's not even hard. It's just a very, uh, it's a problem that takes a very long time to solve. Um, it, the, I think the best way of, of thinking about how mining works is that imagine that you have um, a single pin, um, uh, like a hairpin or something that you put um, you know, uh, in the wall or something like that, a simple pin. And then you have a hill, a mound of hay, the, the thing that sheep eat and such. Um, and your job is to find the pin in the bale of hay. Great, how do you do that? There's no efficient way of doing it. Um, you sort of just have to pick up one hay by one hay. Is this the pin? Is this the pin? Is this the pin? Um, and at some point, and it will take you a very long time, um, you will find the pin. And that's how mining works. Um, we make computer code uh, find a random number within a very, very large data set. Um, that will on average take that computer a certain amount of computing power um, that will cost a certain amount of, of, of money to find that pin. Um, and that is how we guarantee that miners whose job is only to share what is happening on the blockchain. So miners can say, Sina sent to Haney eight Bitcoins. And so Haney's wallet has eight more Bitcoins, Sina's wallet has eight less Bitcoins. In order to incentivize the, uh, the miners not to lie. So for example, so that you know, um, I don't hire bad miners that then just uh, steal uh, money from Sina and say that I have more money or something like that. In order to incentivize them, miners have to spend energy, which costs money to post a transaction. And they're all doing it uh, at the same time. And so um, if your, uh, record of what's happening on the trends uh, on, on the blockchain differs from seven other miners, then clearly you are lying. You will lose the money that you spent. Um, it will be significant financial loss, and that's not going to be recorded. So that's sort of how mining uh, works. Um, we've had some very good news on the mining front in that it was uh, very concentrated um, in China, uh, but then has uh, very quickly moved out uh, and now is in Europe with the largest mining pool as of two weeks ago, actually in North America, which is a very, very good thing. Honey, I will, uh, as a last uh, question, perhaps, a, a, in terms of, the, of your business, I would like to ask that question. How do you compare a, your ABTC or your, your ETF to one famous I, it's not an ETF, it's a trust, actually, a GBTC, Grayscale yeah. uh, investment. 
Um, that's a very simple answer. We believe $10 worth of Bitcoins should be worth $10. Depending on the day, um, Grayscale will sell you $10 worth of Bitcoin for $14, $12, $6. Um, and so what you're buying isn't really exposure to Bitcoin. It's, um, it's, it's a much more complicated function. Uh, we think that people want to invest in crypto. And so when you come in and when you spend $100 on the stock, you get $100 worth of crypto. We buy $100 worth of crypto in the background and store it. Um, and that's it. Nothing, nothing um, crazier than that. Um, and actually, the largest institutional holder of the Grayscale product um, is ARK. Uh, ETFs uh, led by Kathy Wood. Kathy is one of our investors, sits on our board of directors, um, and very much um, is only using Grayscale because it's the only product that Americans can use today. But with the advent of a, an American Bitcoin ETF, we believe that the Grayscale product will, will become um, a lot less attractive. Right now, it just happens to be for primarily Americans, the only way of accessing um, crypto on the public. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time, I believe. However, I would like a minute of you just to, I mean, we have an audience that have many different interests in, in the cryptocurrency, investment, transactions, government issues, regulations, criminality. What would be your last message in terms of understanding that this is a very complex topic. It's not easy to understand in a while. Uh, so what would be your, your final message from your point of view and your business that you are now? And what do you see in the future? One minute, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it simple. Um, I think when investing in new technology, uh, we should think about things in the macro. It doesn't make sense. No one that invested in Google really looked at the uh, algorithm of, of how they uh, rank the pages, which makes them a better search engine. And in a similar way, I think a lot of the questions on mining sort of missed the point. What is happening here is that we are facing a number of different inflection points that are happening at the same time that will create a lot of value. One, our monetary system is moving from the traditional analog old world into the new digital world. That is pretty exciting. That's a technological shift. Two, the American century is ending. What will the new sovereign currency be? That is a geopolitical um, uh, risk. Three, a lot of new millennials, uh, young people, there is an intergenerational shift and they're not interested, they're not buying, the data shows this, the old products. Um, and there are a number of uh, these other factors. And I think we can just take a look at the macro and it's pretty unique. Um, and, and part of why we've grown so quickly in such a short period of time, the entire industry, is that there are headwinds that are significant, not just from one thing, but actually from three, four or five different factors. And when you combine them together, I think everyone here can agree on one of them or, or two of them. And all it takes is just one for you to be able to confidently put money in. Um, it is foolish not to have any money in crypto, whether that is 1%, 5%, or 10% of your portfolio depends on your strategy and your risk profiles. But we generally speaking would advise every single person to just get off of 0% allocation, even if it's 1%. Crypto is here, it's here to stay, it's going to solve fundamental problems, uh, and it's going to be incredibly strengthened by three or four or five different very macro, political, social, economic, uh, generational factors that will only lead to greater success for it. Well, thank you very much. You have been very interesting. Uh, I, for those who, I couldn't address the questions in the audience. Please feel free to send it to us and, and we'll try to, to answer them. Um, gracias a la audiencia. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Eh, y trataremos, we will try, trataremos de hacer otros seminarios similares para que poder aclarar las dudas en todas las áreas que esto implica. Yeah, translating and telling the audience that we will try to make other seminars similar to to address all the issues and questions that people have. Thanks, and have a, have a very good day, all of you. Thank you very much for having us, everybody. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Thank, Thank you, you Hani and Sina, from the name of the Swiss Chamber of Commerce and everyone to participate. Thank you so much. Have a good day and a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Good day.